Love stories are usually sweet, but sometimes they take a pretty dark turn. Back in the day, a video went viral on social media and got everyone's attention around the globe. Here, the main character is a lady named Christine Belford, and it is a not-so-happy love story of 2011. Now, if we talk about her love story, there is no doubt it was full of twists and turns. After her first marriage hit the rocks, she stumbled upon this seemingly awesome dude named David. He's not just your average Joe. He's a successful optometrist. Fate works in mysterious ways, right? Turns out they first crossed paths when Christine was working for him. Fast forward to 2001 and bam! Wedding bells are ringing and they're setting up shop in a sweet house in Middletown, Delaware. Christine brings her daughter, Katie, from her previous marriage into the mix. After on, they go on to have not one, not two, but three daughters of their own. Now, here's where it gets juicy. Everything's all rosy until David decides it's a brilliant idea to invite his parents, Thomas and Lenore, to crash at their place. Now, Thomas, the dad, is a former New Jersey police officer who had a bit of a rocky career. Rumor has it, he got the boot at some point. And Lenore? Katie spills the tea on her strong-minded and not exactly winning any awards for being nice. Talk about a plot twist in the fairy tale. Later on, they both had a lot of misunderstandings in their marriage, and for the next five years, she was trying to make it work. In that delicate situation, Christine decides she's had enough and pulls the trigger on a divorce in January 2006. You'd think a clean break and shared custody would be the way to go, right? Not in David's playbook. Moreover, this whole situation affects her mentally. That's why Christine spills the beans to her therapist about the whole mess with David. Turns out he's pulling some serious stunts, claiming Christine's bipolar and even attempting to have her committed. Like, seriously? But a psychologist checks them both out and surprise, surprise. You know, it's David who's got the issues. Now the guy's got this control freak vibe going on. He's not just satisfied with shared custody, he wants it all. He's out there trying to be the king of decisions, wanting the kids to set up camp at his place full time. Big surprise for sure. Fast forward to February 2007, and against all odds, they're granted shared custody. You'd think that would be a win for Christine, but oh no, the roller coaster ride is far from over. In August 2007, David drops the bomb. He's taking the girls to Disney with his mom, Lenore. Christine, being the trusting soul, gives the green light, thinking, what could go wrong? All she asks is for them to be back before school starts in September. If only things were that simple. So by September 2007, David, Lenore, and the gang were late for two whole days past their return date. Christine's getting anxious, especially after talking to one of her daughters, who spills the beans about being stuck in the car for what feels like forever. Gradually, things take a mysterious twist when Christine thinks they are jet-setting. But nope, they're apparently on a cross-country road trip. At this point, the Newcastle County Police make sure of their interference in this matter. Interestingly, they dig into David's bank accounts, and the last time his account saw any action was in North Carolina. Certainly, the police whip out a search warrant for David's Middletown crib. Sherlock Holmes would be proud because they found the smoking gun. Additionally, the fireplace was put to use, and guess what they found? Christine's divorce papers and evidence of a mysterious New Zealand bank account. Now it's interrogation time. They grill Thomas, David's pops, and Amy Gonzalez, his sister. Both of them pull a Jedi mind trick, claiming they've got no idea where Lenore and David are. See, David, sly as a fox, sold his optometry business for a cool $650,000. Also, he pulls a mastermind move and forges Christine's signature on a document for a $249,000 line of credit. Now, Christine's not sitting idly by. She's hitting the media circuit, doing interviews left and right, shouting from the rooftops about getting her kids back. Then, by November 2007, the US Marshals jumped into the game. They catch wind of some fishy money business between Matosiewicz's accounts, draining a retirement fund of $100,000. Lenore's living the high life, buying an $82,000 RV, and the police send out a global bulletin with all the details, playing RV detective. Meanwhile, Thomas, David's dad, decides to buy a piece of land near the Mexican border. And Amy, David's sister, is playing hard to get with the police. Surprisingly, they're moving to Texas. Cue the Texas-sized showdown. 
But wait, it gets even more international. Interpol joins the party, revealing David's chilling in Panama, having bought a house and all. But the guy's like a slippery eel. He catches wind, does a vanishing act, and Panama is left scratching its head. Fast forward to March 2009, the kids and the Matusiewicz Circus have been missing for a long 19 months. Plot twist, they're living the RV life in Catarina, Nicaragua. The police get on the case, the embassy is involved, and US Marshal William David becomes the superhero making the call. They found the elusive Blanco family. The kids are skinny, one's got pink eye, and their teeth are in a sorry state. The locals even nicknamed David and Lenore the kidnappers. David and Lenore, smelling trouble, decide to cut a deal. They plead guilty to avoid the courtroom drama. David gets slapped with a 48-month sentence, while Lenore gets a lighter 18-month stint. Now, Christine's not taking any chances and learned a lesson for life. With David behind bars, she's got her lawyer, Timothy Hitchings, filing to terminate his parental rights. And this, my friend, is the last straw for David. Less than a month into his sentence, a website pops up like a bad penny. Lenore dubs it her affidavit, making serious, and let's be real, pretty wild allegations against Christine. Undoubtedly, the drama just keeps unfolding, and you can't help but wonder what's next in this roller coaster of a story. In March 2011, someone decided to play director and post surveillance footage of Christine and her kids on YouTube. This was insane. According to the footage, they're being stalked and filmed from the cozy confines of a car. In the video, one of the girls darts into the street, and Christine, being the responsible mom, goes to scoop her up. But, oh no, the unseen filmmaker wants it to look like Christine's yanking her daughter's arm. Talk about some serious evil purpose. Fast forward to September 16th, 2010, and Lenore, the drama queen, gets released from the slammer. She packs her bags and heads to Texas to join the Matusiewicz reunion. Unfortunately, Christine's not catching any breaks either. She spilled to a friend that she's got this eerie feeling of being watched 24 seven. July 2011 rolls around and Lenore's got some free time on her hands. So what does she do? Prints out web pages, probably with a wicked grin and mails them to Christine's friends, colleagues at church and even the school principals. At this point, Christine's world is unraveling. She quits her job at the church and just sinking into the depths of depression. Katie spills the tea that her mom's putting on a brave face, but you can tell it's taking a toll. Then suddenly, the internet plays its tricks. Christine finds a supposed friend named Cindy online, who claims to be an ex of David's and knows all the family dirt. Every day, Cindy's pestering Christine about the kids, and they're sharing pictures like old friends. But Katie and Christine's boyfriend, Gerald, are giving Cindy the side eye. As December 2011 hits, guess who rolls into town from Texas? None other than Thomas and Lenore make a surprise visit to Christine and Gerald's home. But the plot twist, Christine's not there. And the whole thing turns into a confrontation with Christine's friend. Talk about a family reunion gone wrong. So, Christine's feeling the heat and decides it's time to sell the house because, well, Thomas and Lenore know exactly where she lives. Conveniently, a real estate agent happens to be in the neighborhood and they're game to snap some pics of the joint. Talk about luck, right? But wait, my curious fellows, because Christine and Gerald are not messing around. Before David gets released from the slammer on April 13th, 2012, they turn their fortress into Fort Knox. Surveillance cameras, check. Two German shepherds on guard duty, double check. They're not taking any chances with this crew. Now, David's out, but things are far from peachy. Christine, with the law on her side, files for child support. But David, being the stubborn dude he is, slams the door on that one. So, the court date is set for February 11th, 2013. The morning of the big day, Christine and her friend Beth are courthouse bound by 8 a.m. Meanwhile, Thomas and David roll in from Maryland, where they spent the night. And here's where it gets downright bone chilling. Around 8 a.m., the courthouse lobby echoes with gunshots. It's chaos shell casings everywhere, shattered glass from the revolving door. A guy steps out from behind a pole and starts firing. And it turns out it's none other than Thomas Matusiewicz. And if that's not grim enough, he then turns the gun on himself. Christine, walking in first with Beth following, takes multiple shots to the chest. Beth tries to make a run for it, but Thomas catches up. Both women end up in the hospital, but the outcome is gut-wrenching. 
they're both pronounced dead. It's a horrifying twist in a story with too many dark corners. So after the courthouse madness, the Newcastle County Police scoop up David and put him in cuffs. When they drop the bomb that his dad's gone, the guy doesn't even flinch. Talk about stone cold. Quick thinking by the police though. Furthermore, they race to the schools and snatch up Christine's kids before Lenore or Amy can get their hands on them. Safety first, right? The whole crew gets shuffled off to an undisclosed location to keep them out of harm's way. David spills the beans about his car parked in the courthouse garage. Inside his car, they find whole weapons, binoculars, handcuffs of all sizes, a cattle prod, seriously, and a giant knife. Somebody's been watching too many action movies and the plot thickens. David gives up the Maryland address where they had been staying. Lenore's captured at the scene, and Amy, claiming ignorance, gets caught too. But wait, there's a twist after the tragedy. Amy, in some bizarre alternate universe, tries to file for custody of the kids. Yeah, that gets shut down quickly. Then, it's Texas time. The police raid the Ed Couch residence and hit the jackpot, guns, ammo, and a chilling handwritten note from Thomas. He knew he'd never be setting foot in that house again. Oh, and here's the kicker. They were part of a group called the Sovereign Citizens Movement. Basically a gang that hates the government and thinks it's all a big conspiracy against them. Eventually, the police connect the dots and point fingers at David, calling him the Puppet Master. Even from his prison cell, after his kidnapping stint, he was pulling the strings. The brilliant idea for that nasty webpage about Christine? Yep, that was all him. Lenore, with her daughter playing secretary, was just following orders. And get this, the YouTube video? It came straight from the hospital where Amy worked. Hold on to a second, because this whole thing takes a seriously twisted turn. The Matusiewicz crew wasn't just content with their courthouse drama. They went full-on undercover work. So, get this, they roped in Cindy, who was head over heels for David, to cozy up to Christine online. Even with Christine's profile on lockdown, Cindy's newfound friendship got her VIP access to all the juicy posts. But that's not where the snooping ends. They hire a real estate agent to play undercover photographer, snapping pics of Christine's house from the inside. And it gets even creepier. They recruit their buddies to play spy, cruising by Christine's place, taking notes on who's coming and going, and even jotting down license plate numbers. Now, just a day before David's walking out of the custody of a free man, the prosecution drops the bombshell. They're hitting David, Lenore, and Amy with charges of cyberstalking resulting in murder. Cue the legal circus. 600 exhibits of evidence hit the courtroom, and the prosecution threw down the cult card, claiming the Matusiewicz were running the show like some messed up cult. But of course, the defense is sticking to their guns, saying they're as innocent as kittens. Now. Here's the courtroom drama. Christine's therapy tapes are played for all to hear. But wait for it, her daughter, only 13 at the time, steps up and drops a bombshell. Turns out, all those abuse allegations were straight up lies. The kid even Googled herself and stumbled on that chilling YouTube video. She's not even surprised that Thomas pulled the trigger, claiming they all saw it coming. Fast forward to February 18th, 2016, the verdict's in. David, Amy, and Lenore are all slapped with guilty labels. Life in prison, no parole, the whole rough affair. Surely they deserved it. Now here's the gut punch. The three girls are thrown into foster care after Christine's tragic end. But Katie, the survivor in this mess, holds on to hope. She dreams of the day she'll be reunited with her sisters. And you know what? Katie's got a daughter of her own now. The Matusiewicz saga reads like a chilling thriller with its toxic mix of cyber stalking, manipulation, and a family torn apart by delusion. However, the impact on Christine's family is immeasurable. Lives forever altered, children left in the aftermath of a disturbing legacy. Whereas justice, in the form of life sentences, may have been served, the scars run deep. The tale of the Matusiewicz family is a dark reminder of the corners human relationships can descend into, leaving us all with a sobering reflection on the fragility of trust and the depths to which one family's dysfunction can reach. Thanks for watching this entire story with us. If you enjoyed Christine's journey and want to show some support for her, don't forget to hit those like, share, and subscribe buttons down below. Your small efforts can make a big difference in contributing to Christine's quest for peace and justice. Catch you later.